Okay, so welcome back everybody. Um, now we are going to move to our next speaker, Mr. Farouz Akbarov. Now, Mr. Farouz is a philanthropist by nature. He is committed to volunteering public engagement both at home and abroad, physically and remotely. There are several projects to his name, such as Ted Master Virtual Speaking Club, 20 minutes talk with the founder, Zoom workshop for ESL teachers and others. He has become an international ESL instructor due to his intensive teaching abroad and his international teaching qualifications. He is one of the fewest English teachers from Azerbaijan with international C2 level. Mr. Farouz has been the most celebrated international model, United Nations participants, from Azerbaijan with seven awards. Since 2020, he has firmly established his online presence across various international platforms as a successful international public speaker. He is also the founder of a newly established ETA Azerbaijan, English Teachers Association. His motto in life, let's take, sorry, take the first step. Thank you so much for being here with us, Mr. Farouz. And Mr. Farouz will give us the presentation on how to foster motivation in students and teachers. We definitely need that. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, am I audible? Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, by the way, I come from Uzbekistan and this is in the heart of Central Asia. So warm greetings to all of those people out there watching me at this time around. I hope you will gain a lot of insights um, by the end of my presentation. But before I jump right into my presentation, I'd like to reflect upon a couple of um, Zoom etiquette that we've uh, witnessed uh, previously. Nelson Mandela once famously quoted, education is the most powerful weapon to change the world. My fellow global educators and teachers and leaders and, and all kinds of people from all different walks of life, if you're watching me, uh, please pay attention to this. Before changing the world, I think we have to change ourselves. We have to be respectful to the people who are sharing their knowledge and know-how and expertise absolutely free of charge. If you go in and, and, and enroll into any kind of tuition uh, tutorial, you have to pay for that. But you know, this is a global platform where the global educators are converging and bringing their best to you for free. So again, please be mindful and respectful of your words in the chat box and be respectful to all the people in the Zoom house because this is not a frequent event. This is once a year event when global educators are converging to share their valuable insights with all of you. With that being said, I'd like to uh, introduce my topic as it was early introduced by the moderator. How to, uh, how to foster motivation in students and teachers. My name is Farooz Akbarov, and let's jump right into the presentation. Okay, um, here you can see a cake and a cherry on the cake. Well, um, I'd like to uh, turn with a question to you. You have a plate, a cake, and a cherry on the cake. Which one do you think reflects the term motivation best. So could you please put your answers in the chat box? And I'd like to check it out. So um, which one of those do you think symbolize motivation best? The plate, the cake, or the cherry? Okay, we have the first answer. Thank you very much, Anna. Cherry, cherry, cake, plate, right, cherry. Okay, I love this engagement. Now it's a different scenery. Cherry, what else? Cake, okay, thank you. Right, mm -hmm. cool. Cake, wonderful, Darina. Cake, okay, what else? Okay, the answers keep coming in. Crema, okay, all right. What else? Table, wow, table, yeah, plate. Okay, there were three choices, right? The plate, the cake, and the cherry. So, um. You know, I love saying this to my students. There is no right or wrong answer. You know, like one of the participants said, 
It's a table. Why not? Or maybe it's a ground that, you know, the table sits on. So we can go further and further. But, you know, I'll just give you three options. And out of three options, you know, to the best of my knowledge, the plate, you know, sounds more like the foundation, right, to the cake and the cherry on top. So, you know, I'm going to tackle the deepest root of education system, which is, in my belief, none other than motivation. So plate, in this case, symbolizes motivation. Just like in this example, the pillars, just imagine a, a beautiful, you know, ancient style architecture that stands on giant pillars. And if you are going to remove those pillars, you know, the, the entire building would be, you know, flattened to dust. And that's what the same case with, you know, education being on top and it is supported by giant pillars of motivation. So I hope you will get lots of, you know, more elaboration and explanation towards the end of the presentation. In this presentation, I'm going to provide some insights on how to foster motivation first in students and followed by the teachers. Now let's take a look at how to foster motivation in students. I'm going to provide some um, user-friendly and quite practical examples that you can immediately put into practice and implement within your classroom setting. Here is my first tip related, uh, regarding the student motivation. Get outdoors. Why do you have to get stuck indoors within the uh, cramped confinements of the classroom? Instead, just you know, invite your students into a change of scenery. Just you know, get outdoors. This is directly for the teachers who are trying to motivate their students, or this is a tip for the students who are trying to improve themselves on their own. Because education can go either way, either you know, student working on their, themselves or the student is being guided by the teacher. So get outdoors. Let me provide you with an example. In this picture, you can see me with a group of um, avid English learners from Tajikistan, and we're somewhere on the outskirts of the capital city, Dushanbe. This is quite a mountainous uh, area. Actually, the entire country comprised 93% uh, of mountains. And here we were having an outdoor lesson. Well, it was not a lesson, actually. This was um, more like a change of scenery for the students to engage, to engage using their English. You know, they have learned lots of, you know, a theory and tips and knowledge, everything, you just name it, within the classroom. But they didn't have this alternative scenery where they could put immediately everything they learned into the real life setting, into the real world setting. So this is where some of the students started trembling, shivering, sweating, you know, and struggling and even stuttering just because they've never been given this practical opportunity to you know, utilize all they have learned previously in the class. So th this was you know, a fantastic experience of getting the students outdoors to the totally different teaching environment where they could feel like, you know, okay, this is more like a real life scenery where we have no hassle, no stress, you know, no pressure. So we can learn and, and, and relearn and, and re reuse everything we learn in the class. And most importantly, we can gain more practice and practical experience. So, you know, this, is, this could be one of the good examples of how to foster motivation in your students. Just get them outdoors, you know, make them feel part of the nature, part of the real world. The world exists outside the confinements of the classroom but not the tiny, teeny, tiny classroom alone. So we have to change our mindset a bit and invite them to a different um, place where they could enhance their skills. My next tip is called 3D effect. Well, what do I mean by 3D effect? Let me provide you with an example. This is an example from capital Tashkent city uh, in Uzbekistan, where I invited my students to uh, the Temurid State Museum. And you can see there, there's a guide and there's a stand where you can scan the, uh, the AR, the augmented reality. And interestingly, 
once you scan on, on your smartphone, the augmented reality, the, uh, the conqueror of the ancient times will just uh, come out galloping on his horse and he would say, I am Amir Timur, the great conqueror. You know, you would have the ancient uh, figure speaking in English to your students. They've never experienced this real life experience. They have been just reading about this uh, character through the history annals, but you know, they had no idea of having that person live in the augmented reality talking to them and trying to interact. You know, this is an eye opener. This is a mind boggling experience when your students would love being enrolled into such kind of, you know, practical lessons where they could um, harness the, uh, the effects of the technology, where they could just be part of the real world setting, not just sitting in the class and flipping through a monotonous black and white tedious textbooks. So you need to invite them to the real world setting where they could, you know, experience 3D effect. And that can help a lot. My next example of how to foster motivation in students is about process being put in contrast with the outcome. So what do I mean by that? Let me uh, provide another insight. Since I'm a global um, ESL EFL instructor, I taught across different countries. And this example comes from the north of China, a Baoding city. It's, it's about one hour's train ride from Beijing, the capital Beijing. I used to teach at a language school in a tiny school, uh, in a tiny uh, city called Baoding. And my students, you know, in a tiny city, they were not even familiar with the Western festivals, you know, let alone uh, Santa. So, and they were not enthusiastic about celebrating these Western festivals. And what I did was, you know, they were just focused on exam-oriented learning. So they, they were just concerned about the outcome, about passing certain kind of standardized government and school tests. But they were not even interested about celebrating some festivals and learning by celebrating through some festivals. So I had to dress up as a Santa, that is me. So I had to dress up as a Santa and I actually approached the school authority to celebrate uh, Christmas with the school, uh, with, with, with the school uh, population. And I tried to, you know, poke a lot of fun, ignite their curiosity. And I tried my best to, you know, get them on, on the same page with me. I tried to engage them. So I just wanted them to love the process of learning rather than, you know, being uh, stressfully concerned about the, the results of, of certain tests. Because learning is not about, you know, passing certain kind of tests or achieving certain kind of excellence in terms of passing tests. But it's more like enjoying the process of learning and while, you know, uh, subconsciously, unconsciously trying to gain lots of skills. So I try to, you know, change the scenery for my Chinese students by inviting them to enjoy the process of learning. So in my third example, if you want to foster motivation in your students, really focus on the process itself, because the process could be enjoyable and memorable and unforgettable, rather than focusing on the end goal, which is you have to pass this test. Otherwise, I'll lose my job or otherwise you will not enter the university. You know, you shouldn't, you know, spook your students. You shouldn't uh, uh, make them feel uh, stress out because of a uh, certain kind of standardized tests. Perhaps uh, the educational authorities should really uh, take time to reflect on certain defects that have been prevailing all along, perhaps for centuries. This was my third, uh, third tip. Focus on the tip, uh, focus on the process, but not the outcome. And now let's focus on the teachers, how to foster motivation on the teachers. You know, the teachers, they are uh, doomed to, they're likely to have some uh, burnout because sometimes they feel like, okay, my job is underpaid or not well paid or less paid. And, you know, um, 
I'm not getting any kudos appreciation from my school authority uh, for what I have been doing so far. So they're likely to be some kind of demotivation and despair and hopelessness and all that problem may crop up down the line. But here are some of the practical tips which you could you know, try to turn around the situation. My first tip is, are you being the singer or the conductor? So perhaps after the presentation, you may reflect on the answer or you may, even you may put it in the chat box. Could you please put it in the chat box? You, do you think you are a singer in the class or the conductor? What do, you, what do you think? You can put S for singer or C for conductor. I'll um, take a pause. Yeah, C, Anna is C, perfect. Okay, S, Nina is singer, C, okay? Both, S and C, C, Alfia is C, okay? C, Chair Lamia Baraka, C, okay? Right, C, cool. I love your engagement, this is fun, I love it. Because this is pretty much you know, in my DNA to have an engaging presentation rather than holding a, a monotonous lecture style. Okay, lots of answers, thank you very much. My fellow friends, if you are, you know, by any chance being a singer in your classes, then you may lose motivation somewhere, you know, along your journey because your, your journey is, is, is so long. It's not going to end anytime soon. It's perhaps a 50, 60 year stellar teacher career. And if you've been only a singer, you know, a solo singer, so you're likely to burn out and you're likely to get demotivated because that is not going to impress your students. You should give them the opportunity to pre present themselves. So you have to step back and take the role of a conductor and gradually release your responsibilities onto the shoulders of your students. My next example is about smart versus hard. One of the reasons why uh, the English teachers specifically may be struggling with their classes in terms of motivation is down to the fact that we have perhaps two kind of teachers who are really doing a smart job. And on the other hand, the others who are really working hard. And by working hard, you may not get the intended motivation, but by working smart, you will get the motivation as well as the effect. Let me show you three major areas where I think the problem might be going on. Uh, the first one is guided discovery. You know, one of the best things I've ever learned by doing my CELTA course uh, years ago in Krakow, in, in Poland, was guided discovery. Up until that moment, I have not known about guided discovery because our education in our education system, it's more like the teacher has to take all the responsibility. And the teacher, you know, is not able or doesn't want to release the responsibility over to the students. And that's why we have another problem, which is student autonomy. The students are not quite autonomous. They're not free thinkers. You know, they, they have to depend always on somebody's guidance and supervision, just because they have not been put onto their thinking shoes to reflect on what, what, they, what they have been doing so far. So those are two problems that are interrelated. And last but not least, critical thinking. When you know, the students are not guided, when the students do not have autonomy, obviously it's going to end up when students have lack of critical thinking or no critical thinking at all. And this is one of the major 21st century skill set which we have to foster in our students. If you don't have those, you know, factors and elements and aspects in your classes, perhaps that's one of the reasons why you are losing your motivation as a teacher, because you are doing most of the job while your students being, you know, less engaged or demotivated. Celebrate success. I like this, you know, I, up until now, I didn't pay attention much to celebrating success. To me, it was more like an honor because uh, I have achieved a lot of success in the past. I'd like to share most of the recent uh, successes that I had. On your left, I recently attended um, 
international conference at Karakalpak State University, where you know my uh, presentation skills were awarded uh, by the authority for, as as the um, excellent presenter and a speaker. So you know this is just a small success, but this is an opportunity to celebrate it because once you celebrate it, you remember that you put a lot of effort into it in the past. That it wasn't you know all of a sudden that you you were just given this award. It, it didn't happen all of a sudden. So once you achieve the tiniest success in your life, take a moment and celebrate it in the best fashion possible because that is an incentive. That is an investment in the future successes. And on your right, you can see uh, the Universal Leadership Award that is given by Educacia World to the excellent, outstanding educa uh, global educators. And they found my um, volunteering initiatives that I've been doing globally for the past seven months, they found it worthy enough to award this prestigious award, which I didn't expect at all. But I still didn't, didn't you know, find time to celebrate these successes because I've been running a very a tough and hectic schedule. I think uh, towards the end of the week, I'll find a little time to really celebrate this success because that can give me a big motivation as a teacher to move forward, to move ahead. Okay. Another tip of mine is um, you need to look back. You know, sometimes once you feel demotivated, you need to look back and reflect on things you've done in the past. It's not only for the sheer sake of um, reflection, but also for getting a sense of pride and a sense of accomplishment. Okay, I'm sure there are a lot of people in this house who have done some great things in the past. You know, we forget the past, but Confucius had a, uh, had a nice saying. He said, study the past if you would define the future. So if you would like to get even more stellar career ahead of you, look back because you might have accomplished some great things in the past. And that can itself can give you a great motivation. So I'll show you one last slide why, you know, uh, the, the teachers and students are not having motivation in your, you know, within the educational context. Uh, number one is it's because there is less room for creativity. It's more predictable and standardized. So there is no space or room for creativity. And that can be too boring. There is no environment. There is no um, conducive environment to um, you know, nurture, skill set. We have been loudly talking about 21st century skill set, but in the real classrooms, my dear friends, we are not really nurturing any skill set. We're just talking about the, the skill set. So if you are able to nurture any kind of skill in your students, they will have more motivation. And you as a teacher will have, you know, twice the motivation for your profession. We are teaching the classes where we're not really regarding and, and taking into account different talents that the students bring into class. You know, some of them are good at math, some of them are good at um, science, or some of them are linguistically competent. So we need to have a class which is, you know, all talent friendly, but not focusing on certain students only. Positive environment. Most of the times we have no motivation because we're not happy with the environment. You know, a while ago, there were a couple of um, rude and impolite people who were trying to affect the presenter's presentation, and they were trying to destabilize the, the, the environment. They wanted to make it, you know, all too uh, toxic. But, you know, luckily, they can't do anything else because we are powerful educators. We cannot submit and surrender to these kind of impolite and unfriendly people. As an educator, you have to set an example like Ms. Uh, Yvonne Dolorto did. She did a fabulous job. She maintained a composure. I loved her presentation. She set a, an excellent example of how to face any kind of challenge with the best composure. So the um, positive environment cultivates motivation. And I was talking about the environment and why not about the, the ambience. You have to rotate 
and, and shuffle and change the scenery. Like I said at the very start, you need to take them outdoors. Don't just stay indoors. Change the scenery because your students are way more reflective and thoughtful and insightful and creative than you think. So why not take them to different scenery? Last but not least, any kind of teaching, any kind of class has to be practical. If it's not practical, then the students would obviously lose motivation in finding the connection between what you are teaching and what they can relate after the lesson. Sorry. Here please. are some of the good examples. I'll quickly walk you through Wuhan, China. These students were demotivated. They were not interested in English at all because English was not their major subject. But, you know, I tried to change the situation and it was such a great turnaround that they loved English and that the, the love being as a family, as a big united family upon my course. So some more examples of how I try to motivate people. My job as an educator is not to teach anyone because you have been teaching yourself. You have been learning you know, a lot on your own. My job is to ignite your curiosity and to spark creativity in you. So my job is more like a motivator. And that's why I chose this topic. You know, at the end of the day, when you look at your students and you say, was that amazing? And you will get the answer. What do you think? Was my presentation amazing? I'd like to uh, hear from you. Now I'll take a little moment to look at the chat box. And yeah, so was that amazing? If your students would give you yes, you know, a strong, powerful yes, that means as an educator, you did your part. Because your, your part, your job was not about teaching something from the books, which they can do you know, on their own. Your job is far different. It's more like a leader, a motivational speaker, you know, a motivator, an inspirer, a role model. So let me Thank carry you so on. Much, Pedros. It's always inspiring to hear you. And this is this is my uh, last quote. I'm going to finalize. Um, uh, as as was mentioned by the moderator, I have been the founder for the past seven months of um, of a global uh, volunteering movement named as ETA Uzbekistan English Teachers Association. So this is my quote as the founder of that uh, initiative and movement, let people fall in love with what you do. And if you sum up the entire quote, you will get none other than motivation. So your job is to motivate people. And this is the best thing the, the global educators can do. And you're always free to reach me out through social uh, media, I'm pretty active across all types of social accounts. So LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, that's all from me. I'd like to um, thank Educational Webinar Gen for facilitating this great opportunity of being part of global convergence of global educators where I had my time to voice my concerns related to things we can do about changing the global education system to the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Feroz. It's always a pleasure to have you. An inspiring presentation as always. Yep. Thank you so much, Feroz. Um, now we'll move to the questions part. Does anybody have any question for Feroz? Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the question or you can simply write it in the chat box and we'll read it for you. All right, we have a question from Riham Hilal. Could you please tell us more about your experience with your Wuhan kids challenges and ways to overcome these problems? Thank you very much for asking that question. Uh, there was a reason why I've shown that, uh, that picture because in Wuhan, I tried to uh, incorporate a technique called the voice and choice. What, what is meant by the voice and choice? Prior to me, 
they had uh, other foreign English teachers, but uh, they, they've been repeating uh, the same mistake over and over, like they were trying to teach in a very teacher-centered manner. But once I was invited to that particular university, I tried to do things very differently from day one. And the first thing I introduced to my students was uh, the technique of voice and choice. So I tried to listen to their problems of why they were not so happy and pleased about learning English. So what were their previous experiences like and the ways that they were taught previously by different teachers. And I, would, I also gave them a choice of choosing their favorite um, style of teaching. Let's say the, the incorporation of games, fun, and all that jazz. So I tried my best to you know, collect all those feedback and suggestions from all those uh, Chinese students and try to reflect on how to you know, build a, a lesson which, which would resonate with most of those students. Of course, you know, sometimes it's not possible to achieve 100% result, but uh, the model that I created in Wuhan, which was fully compatible uh, with most of those students because uh, they had the ideas put into my curricular and the courseware. So I was given a different curricula by the, by the university authority, but then I asked it, I, I talked to the university authority to change, to change the curricular and do it in my way. And I asked them to kindly give me some time, at least towards the end of the semester. So I should thank them for understanding me. They gave me time. It was a pilot project. And at the end of the semester, I was able to change entire teaching scenery in that particular university. And you know, I had different uh, two kinds of classes. One was English major and the other was English minor. So at the end of the semester, English minor students for whom English wasn't compulsory and they wouldn't be graded, they were more curious about my classes. So I would have some outsiders, some students from other departments who would just come, who would pop in to engage and love the experience because you know my students would make some uh, video recordings and post it on, on their social media. So it resonated with lot, lots of people. It attracted lots of attention. So a lot of people from other departments were interested and curious about my classes. So the voice and choice worked a miracle. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we have uh, another person who's asking of any ways to contact you after this session. So if you sure, could... I, I showed my uh, one second. I showed my contacts, here they go. With the same name, with the same picture across all profiles, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, I'm available anytime, anywhere. Thank any you questions? So much. Any other questions, guys? Right. I think uh, I am pretty um, approachable and, and easygoing. So please throw your questions at me. I'll try to help you out as much as I can. We'll take one last question from Farah. Sure. Could you kindly unmute quickly? We have to move to our breakout rooms. Thank you. Farah, I asked you to un unmute. Could you please? Okay. Accept? Can I ask the a question? Please yeah. go yeah, ahead. Always, always we're asked in, in school to upscale our standards and give our students um, a higher level uh, text or uh, tasks. I'm an English teacher, I'm asking here. Um, and my, the level of my students is uh, not good enough to understand the height, the hard text or uh, difficult tasks. So how can I solve this problem? Uh, satisfying the administration's uh, desire to upscale the standards or uh, make text hard for students and achieve the needs of students and meet the needs of students. Thank you very much. Um, you know, you've been put into a challenging situation where you have two options and you have, you know, you are, you got stuck at, at a critical juncture. You have no idea wh whether to follow the suit of the authority or to, you know, make peace with your students and, and try to uh, grant their wishes and demands. Well, um, I would, you know, try to share my insight in this regard. 
If I were you, I would first try to sit down with all of the students. This is what I, I always do, actually. This is not just a random tip. This is what I've been doing. Even in the, in the case of Wuhan, I did the same thing. I would sit down with the students, you know, and I would ask them, okay, so uh, what are your priorities attached to learning English? Are you just concerned about getting better grades? If this is your ultimate goal, then I'm your best friend. I can, you know, ensure that you will get the best, uh, the best grades if that alone satisfies you. But then I ask you a question. If you're concerned about the grades, you know, we may not enjoy the process of learning. And in life, you know, grades do not really matter because we've seen great uh, graduates and alumni like uh, Zuckerberg or some others, you know, uh, Steve Jobs, you know, or even uh, Albert Einstein. They were not stellar graduates, but, you know, they did something great, something uh, phenomenal into the uh, world of science. So um, I would try to prioritize their goals and I would even help them to clear out some confusion. Perhaps they might be under the pressure of their parents to get better grades because this is what the extent of their parents' knowledge is. Or perhaps they might have been you know, under the peer pressure because some of their peers are getting better grades but doing nothing or with, with little effort. So in my case, I would just, you know, try to prioritize their goals and help them to clear out all the confusion and, and draw the bigger picture of their future connected with English. This is how it looks in reality. But if you're not going to follow this path, okay, that's your choice. But you may regret, regret at the end of the journey. And I would also, you know, invite the school authority to sit down with me. And I'll try to explain that we have two kind of models if we're going to follow, if we're going to stick to this one, to A1, these are the consequences. These are the implications. But if we're going to, you know, follow the B1, this could be the ideal one that could really upskill or, or upgrade the standard of education system across the university. And that can also help us to improve the, the domestic and global ranking of the institution. You know, we're not just here teaching some of uh, some bunch of students, but we're here to uh, raise and, and, and foster and educate some global future successful leaders and educators. So are we really doing anything in that respect? You know, I would put, I would throw some really critical questions before the, the authority. And, and I'm sure in all those cases, in, the, in all those challenging situations, I tried to clear out all kind of confusion. I tried to, to draw the bigger picture in front of students and the school authority. Well, I was able to meet, to meet them, both of them halfway, and we were able to negotiate and find the best ideal solution to tackle the problem. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Rose. Thank you. That was a very inspiring session.